Dobronut, Nye, Tak, and that's it. I apologize. Um, welcome to uh, Backup and Recovery uh, Strategies as, as per EDB. Um, I will uh, speak slowly. I appreciate that um, Polish isn't my first language, um, so I will speak in English, and if I go too fast, please let me know. What I'm going to talk about today um, is nothing new. Um, the topic's been spoken about many times, but I just want to put some ideas out there um, and invoke some thought um, and some potential solutions. And for those of you that want to stay at the very end, there's a feature that was introduced in 9.3, um, which is called Switchback, which allows you to um, replicate and then replicate back without any backup needs. The people that know what that means are the people that are interested in that feature, so that's at the very end. But up until that point, I'm just going to talk about backup and recovery and what we have in Postgres and EDB. Okay? So, first of all, an introduction as to what backup and recovery really means, uh, and then we'll go through some uh, methods of backup, some methods of security, um, uh, recovery, and finally, I put a matrix together at the very end um, for what backup uh, suits which recovery. Um, it, it's easy to say, but really, depending on what backup strategy you choose, depends on what's reco which recovery strategy you can choose. So, introduction. Seems obvious, but every backup and recovery strategy, uh, or, or every company needs a backup and re uh, recovery strategy to ensure that in a, a crisis situation, they have the data and they have it where they need it. It seems simple, but you really have to think about it. It's not just a case of backing up your database, because you really need to think about how you recover it, how long it's going to take to recover, um, and how much data loss um, you can afford to lose without damaging your brand uh, or without losing too much money. So, database strategies must plan for the various failures, a catastrophic disk failure, uh, a machine failure, a site failure, a network failure, the good old user failure, etc. We also um, put into the mix maintenance. Sometimes you may need to uh, upgrade a, a server uh, or the server's operating system, so you're not actually touching the database, um, but you still need to put that category into your solution. So, first thing, business impact versus the cost. Some questions you should be asking yourself. How long will recovery take? So, a poll in the room. What's the average length of a recovery time when you lose your database? A few hours. Any more? It depends. There's no answer, but thank you anyway. Um, th there's no answer. It depends on your backup strategy. It depends on the actual disaster itself. But you really need to plan that into it. You know, for those five um, uh, events I talked about, you really need to have a solution for each one of them. So if we lost a disk, what's our recovery strategy? If a user drops a table, what's our recovery strategy? Okay. If you can answer that question, then you say, right, how long does it take? So you set the expectations of the business for that type of recovery. If we lose this data, this is how long it's going to take to recover. How long do we need to store the backup data? So we... We do a backup every night, we do weekly backups, we do monthly backups, we do yearly backups. How long do we have to keep that for? Is there a compliance reason that we're keeping it? Or are we just keeping it because we're just keeping it? How much does the... How much does... Is that a question? Sorry? No. How much does uh, the data storage cost? So you may be keeping data, and in a scenario where you lose that data, it may cost you money. But what's the cost of storing that data indefinitely? And is there a trade-off where you could say, well, we could afford a small outage, a small data loss, um, and that is actually more cost-effective than storing data on expensive disks potentially for a long time. Will an outage affect our brand? Now, the reason I put that into the, uh, into the list is something you really need to think about when, if you have an outage and you decide to take the database down to do your recovery, how long, a, how long a downtime could your website, for example, have before you start to damage your brand because they're going elsewhere, they're going to other websites? So again, down to the cost, what can you afford as an outage? It's a strange one, but it's something that people don't always think about is 
can any part of the database stay open whilst I'm recovering what I need to recover? So if you're recovering a table, then could you still leave the database open and utilize other parts of the database? It's a good question, and I don't, I don't go to many sites where people leave the database open. And it may be for a good reason, but it's something that is worth asking. And also, a very important one, when did the problem start? So you now know you have a problem. How do you track back to when that problem started? You may, you may decide that a user made an update 14 months ago, and since then, your figures have been invalid because they're using an updated value that is incorrect. So how do you rectify that? How do you find out? So part of your backup and recovery strategy really needs to understand, first of all, what the problem is, and also how long it's been there. Okay, the backup methods in uh, Postgres are pretty straightforward. We have pgdump and pgdump all. This is really just a, a snapshot of the data in that time. So when you start pgdump, it says, right, any transaction they've already finished, we're going to cater for. So it will dump all of those transactions in a SQL file, um, and then you can utilize that in a recovery situation. And I'll come back to what recovery situa situations later on. But that's the most simple. Database can stay open. Users can stay connected. There's an overhead, but it's not much of an overhead as we drag the data, the SQL out um, to, uh, to a SQL file. The difference between pgdump and pgdump all is uh, pgdump does a database, whereas pgdump all does the whole cluster. Replication. Uh, in 9, replication came in, um, and it's a great solution to get data from one data center to another data center. That can be uh, through synchronous replication or through asynchronous replication, however you want it. But it's still a, a backup source. And if you wanted to, um, just like with Oracle Active Data Guard, you can use that replication. You can use it for read-only transactions, and then you can run backups, uh, backups off it as well. So in your other site, you can run your backups off that replication. So then there's no overhead on the server where your production database is. How's my speed? Cinque. Prosha. OK. Um, continuous archiving and hot backups. When I go to customers, they're always saying we don't have an, uh, um, an incremental backup solution. And it's true, we don't have an Oracle incremental backup solution. Um, and I don't see that in the near future as it is. Um, we've talked about it in the community. We've talked about it at EDB. But the beauty of, archive, of, a, of an incremental is the fact that the backup, you take the first backup, and then you just back up the changes. So if a block changes seven times in a day, you just back up that seventh change because that's what the blo block looks like when you do the incremental backup. We don't do it that that small, when I'm, what I mean by small is we don't have those seven changes um, um, compressed into one with uh, Postgres. What you do is you have your backup, but then you just have your WAL files, just like Oracle have their redo files. You can apply all those WAL files, and that, in a, in a sense, is like an incremental backup. It's not a true incremental. But it means that you can have your base backup, and you can do your nightly backups of incremental, and all you need to do is back up the WAL files which are probably archived off anyway. So you have, of a sort, an incremental backup. Cold backups. Does anybody do cold backups anymore? Let's shut the database down and do a cold backup. Yeah, some people have a need to, you know. It might be a compliance reason. What's the state of the database in an unrecoverable, well, in a recovered state um, as of, you know, the end of the year? Shut the database down and do a cold backup. It serves a purpose. And then a non-Postgres solution, but snapshots, you may use um, Red Hat clustering services, whatever clustering you may use on the operating system, you could uh, use that to back up your, your Postgres, but it's not a Postgres tool. Okay. So downtime scenarios, just again to get you thought provoking, we will get to some technical detail in a minute, but I just want to set the scene as to where we are. So device failure, I know we know what these are, loss of machine, loss of disk, loss of power. All very important, but they all give us a different solution that we need for recovery. So a, a, a loss of power would be a, a different to a loss of disk, which would be potentially different, different to a loss of machine. Site failure. There's one on there that companies never think about, a break-in. If your office was broken into, when I worked for Oracle, one of our data centers was broken into, and the, set, the security guy was still sat there. 
They just went through the back door and they stole quite a few machines. And that had a real impact because we hadn't planned for that type of outage. Yes, we'd planned for a data center failure, a network failure, but when we lost half of the machines, we just hadn't planned for that one. And the reason that causes an issue is half the machines are still working, half the users are still connected to those and the transactions are still going on. So it wasn't a complete site failover that we needed. Data corruption. Nobody produces bad code. We're all good coders. Yes? Yeah? yeah, good, okay. That's the open source community. So sometimes, however, you get code and it does introduce um, uh, a bit of corruption into your data. Again, the problem with that one is how long has the problem been there and when does it capture? Um, and also you get this level of corruption. Postgres have a couple of ways to, to, to solve um, Torn pages, anybody know torn pages in Postgres? Full block writes they do to, to get around torn page solutions. So we don't see corruption at the Postgres level very often, but we do see disk corruption and application introduced corruption. Operator error. You could write a list of a thousand things there, but update error, drop table, drop schema, and even a deletion of a data file. Um, that has an impact because when you start up Postgres, it doesn't check for the data files. It's only when you access a block on the data file that it errors. So you need to put into a scenario where that can be catered for. Maintenance, hardware upgrades, OS upgrades, that is still to be part of your backup and recovery strategy. And then finally, compliance. Your retention periods, readable data, writable data, and the storage of data. And what I mean by that is, if you are backing up data, when you need access to that data, is it just for uh, reporting. Do you actually need it to be in any other state than a readable? That can have an impact on your, your scenarios of recovery. Now the solutions, I've got 50, well, just over 15 minutes to go through these. What I've put together at the, um, well, as, as a precursor to this event is I'm, I'm writing a white paper on these solutions and I want to go through them in some detail and I've put a matrix together as to where we think the, the backup and uh, recovery solutions fit together. And what we've put in here, we've put point in time recovery, uh, PG restore has its place, replication, replication with uh, switchback, so failover and switchback, and then delayed replication, and finally snapshots. So for example, let's just go through a few of them. Point in time recovery. I have a solution where my table was dropped at one o'clock in the afternoon. Using my, my backup and recovery method, I can recover to 12.59.59, just before the table was dropped. And that's great, my whole database is back as it was. But that's a simplistic version or a simplistic solution because how many transactions went on from the table being dropped at one till I noticed at two? So there's a whole hour of transactions there. And if I roll forward using point in time recovery, I stop at 12.59.59. So there's one hour of transactions that I need to be aware of. So this is when it comes down to what's the cost involved in creating a recovery or generating your recovery to cater for the fact you lost a table. Do you take the main database offline? Do your, your point in time recovery in the replication database and then extract all the changes that happened in the last hour using potentially something like PG, uh, PG dump and then import them at a table level into your, uh, your replicated database. Is that the solution that's best for you? Well, there's an impact on the time. There's an impact on the cost of there because your database is down at that time. Or do you leave your database up that you've just brought back to 1259.59 and on the replicated database, restore and recover that lost hour and then import the table into the production? But whilst that table isn't in production, does that have an impact on your data? So a couple of questions there. PG Restore, it's, it's great for um, restoring um, uh, the level of um, uh, objects that you can't do with replication. Replication is replicating everything. PG Restore could do an object level. So I need to restore a table, or I need to restore a trigger, or I need to restore a view. So you've got a finite there where you can go and actually just recover or restore just an object that you need, not the whole database. Replication is a great solution for, recover, uh, for, for recovery. You know, you've replicated to a, a, um, uh, an off-site. You could replicate to an on-site. 
Um, and in a failure situation, you just switch over to that database. So again, it can be um, uh, synchronous, so it's hardly any data downtime at all, or it can be asynchronous, so there may be a bit of catch-up that's needed. And the one that I'm going to talk about is this replication with failover and switchback. Um, 9.3 was introduced um, a parameter called timelines, um, and that allows you to fail from your um, production to your uh, failover or your replicated database, and then fail back again without having to do a backup and restore, which is what you had to do before 9.3. So people were, were complaining because if you did fail over for site maintenance, for example, and you had a 100 terabyte database, you'd then have to reclone that 100 terabyte database and copy it back to the production site just to do the fail back. But it has a great solution. It's an easy solution using timelines. Delayed replication. In 9.4, the Postgres community are introducing a delayed replication. So this... <coughs> Uh, will allow us to get around potentially corruption because we don't want to introduce corruption into our database and then into our replicated database. So by having delayed replication, we could say don't replicate the changes for at least an hour. And that will give you an hour to capture any potential problems. And that's a feature that's going to be introduced in 9.4. However, it's doable now because what you can do is just don't copy the archives across, put them on a delay. So when they get shipped across to the replicated database, just put a one-hour time in there. And then finally, snapshots. Um, you know, there's always a solution there where you, you can use your snapshots to mirror your, um, uh, your database, and then when the problem, break the mirror, and away you go. So here's the back of a recovery matrix that I put together at 2 o'clock this morning. Um, so hopefully the colors are, are viewable. I hadn't been drinking. So the three categories, best fit, good fit, and there's better alternatives to use. So, for example, if you have a device failure, then a point in time recovery is a good fit. There's no reason why you couldn't do that. But at the end of the day, what you're looking for is the best solution. So, for a device failure, it may be replication. Depends on what your backup and recovery strategy is. So, your device failure with replication, you can switch over to the new site or the new database, and away you go with minimal downtime. Delayed replication really isn't a good fit because uh, you don't want to delay. You want to be up as soon as possible, so hence the reason it says that better alternatives. Failover and switch back, you don't need that. PG, well, you don't need that, and the reason you don't need uh, failover and switch back is there's a few things that have to be true to be able to use switch back, and I'll come back to that in the, in the last slide. PG restore is no good, and uh, restore from a cold backup, I would also say, is no good. So you can see what I've done with the matrix there. I've just tried to say what is the best fit. And the only one for, for maintenance, really, I would say, is failover and switchback. That's for OS maintenance and for hardware uh, maintenance, where you need to um, have a controlled shutdown of your production, perform your maintenance um, at, the ma uh, at the same time running your database in the replicated database. The precursor for running switchback is you must shut the production database down cleanly. Once it's shut down cleanly, then you move over to the replicated, you recover the replicated, and away you go. That's the thing you have to do when you want to use switchback. So that's why it's only really good for maintenance, because you're in a controlled situation. Operator error. It's a hard one, operator error, to, to cater for, because there are so many scenarios that the operator can, uh, can, can uh, uh, cause. Um, and you have to cater for those scenarios. So, operator error, point in time recovery is a good fit. Replication, why is replication, sorry, a best fit, why is replication only a good fit? Uh, sorry, why is replication a better alternative for operator error? Why wouldn't you use replication for operator error? Yeah, because depends on what the, well, it depends on what the problem is, you don't want it replicated. So, hence the reason. It doesn't say it's not a good fit in the sense that, you know, you could still do it, but there are better alternatives. And then, finally, I just want to look at the compliance one there. The compliance, PG Restore and Restoring from a Cold Backup, they're good fits because it depends on what the compliance rules are. You don't want to be in a situation, potentially, where you do um, uh, 
a backup of a hot backup and you store the WAL files. You may not be in a situation when you, you do that type of backup and you, you store it for five years and then when you come and get it out of the drawer again, you have to recover because you may not have shut it down cleanly. So what you want to do really is, for compliance reasons, it might be shut the database down in its cleanest state so that you know in five years' time when you need to bring it back up again, there's no recovery needed, there's no reason to, to worry about the archives that hadn't been applied, etc. Okay. So, the only technical bit really where this was introduced in 9.3, so people, if, if you are interested in this, there's a recovery target time, um, time line, I put the wrong one on there, I do apologize, that should say recovery target timeline, um, and you set it to the latest. And what that will do is allow, when you shut the database down, for actually, for it to wait until all the recovery has been rectified, and then shipped across to the replicated database. And then that will be applied on the replicated database in its fullest state. For that to happen, you have to shut down in either uh, smart or fast. And that will actually roll back any transactions and get you into a recovered state before the database shuts down. And that's the only precursor that you have to do for switchback. It just means that you don't have to then back up your replicated database again and push it back to your primary server. But as I said, I did write the wrong parameter down. <laughs> Recovery target timeline. I apologize there. <laughs> the only reason this gentleman came to the, to, to, the, to the class today was to find that one parameter. Um, and then once you are onto the failed over uh, replicated database, uh, you can do all you need on the, um, on the uh, primary um, and then put it back into recovery mode and once you're ready, you just fail back to that uh, original primary and away you go. Okay. If you want any more questions on that, I am writing a white paper, well, I've almost finished it now, and I'm going into all of these scenarios here in a lot more detail. I, I was up to about 70 slides last night and I knew that would be too many. So I'm down to 13 just for today. But there is a lot of work going into the white paper that just goes through some of these details to give you some ideas of better solutions potentially than you were thinking about for your backup and recovery strategy. So looking at this here, anybody got any questions on why I chose what I chose? No? Any other questions? No? Okay, well, thank you for your time. Um, if you do want the white paper sent in to you directly, please leave me your um, business card. We're on the EDB stand. If you come there, we'll send it to you when I finish it. I'm English, so I'll say finish this Friday, probably next Friday. I apologize. Um, and uh, if you do need any more advice or anything, I say I'll be on the EDB stand till 3 o'clock today. Okay, thank you. Dziękuję bardzo.